Nathan, thanks for coming back on. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. So we're going to go through a few areas where you think the folks reading research papers, reading articles, news on AI, uh, make a couple mistakes, get caught up in the hype. Go uh, with the first one um, that we talked about, which was uh, the tendency to label models as better, worse, et cetera, without a sort of context or domain. So talk to me about, about this one a little. Yeah, yeah I mean, and I'll, some... I'll, I'll add some context to that because when we originally brought this up, this is for everyone listening, because when we first brought this up, we were trying to decide like, you know, he's going to be on a second time. Like, we don't want to repeat. Like, what are we going to talk about? And then all of a sudden we started talking about some paper and then we got off on some tangent on like, well, what makes it better? Who's to say it's better? Like, what does that even mean? And then that kind of led into our, our first conversation. So th this is something on the minds of a lot of people. It's like when, when, when someone comes out and says, oh, we are beating this model, we're slightly worse than this model. And it's like, and then people always ask me, Sanan, have you tried whatever Gemini? Is it better than GPT-4? And I'm like, I can't really answer that <laughs> in a sentence or less. So this is the kind of question that we, we get a lot. So uh, we're really curious to hear your perspective. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of timely. We're recording the week of Gemini Ultra becoming available. Earlier this week, seared into my brain was this hilarious tweet where like Francois Cholet, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it in French. That was brutal, rough, embarrassing to my former, former employer. But he essentially gave a tweet that was like, Phi 2 is bad. <laughs> like everyone in industry knows this model is bad. They just trained it to get high eval scores. And it's like, those so people in the open source thing were sad. And I was like, this is why it's a bitter lesson. But I'm like, I'm not surprised. And it was like, how do you tell this from doing this? I think there's a lot of expert driven things. Like I follow synthetic data and alignment methods, whatever these are pretty closely. So I've been kind of, there's like a lot of, there's a specific line of work there with like Lima and then these five models, which is saying like, you can do more with less data, which is kind of a pointer. It's like, whenever there is a big, we did something different that goes against the kind of core truths of what makes deep learning work. You should probably be skeptical. It's like, yes, you can make a small model good, but you probably have to narrow the scope of what you want it to be good at. It's like, there's no free lunch in any of these things. Like, it's like there's no free lunch in AI. Like you can't make a model smaller and better at everything. So you can, might be able to reduce the overall capacity by making it better at one thing. So if anyone's trying to give you the marketing of like, we did everything better than everyone else, that's like kind of a clear answer if it's not as good. And with the Gemini thing, it's like, I think it's pretty clear that if the discussion is happening, if it's legitimately better or worse, that normally means that they're pretty similar. It's pretty easy to tell when a model is actually just not good. And I think Gemini is a little slower. It's pretty clearly a bigger model behind the scenes. And that's a good, like, that's just kind of how it'll be for a while. These models oscillate. Let's try to loop, loop my thinking back to the original question. It's like, how do you know if a model is good when you're going to see a model you're going to, that's going to be accompanied by a bunch of scores. And these numbers tend to mean less than people think, because I think a lot of like MMLU is a big focus for people right now. A lot of models that are being released today are in like this one to 15 billion parameter range. And MMLU is like a multiple, just thinking about the fundamentals of what it is. MMLU is a multiple choice questioning thing. These models that we're releasing, the base models get anywhere from 15 to 50%. And if you just do the basic logic of it, if you're doing a four answer multiple choice question, random is 25%. So it's like, it's not necessarily the same as like an error bar on an evaluation. But if you think about what the random margin is and what just adding a bit of noise would do to the answers, if it could change it by 25%, it's like really hard to look at these numbers. And a lot of other instruction models have a similar problem, which is people are comparing evaluations from like the 10 to 20% range, which is like, are we sure that these low numbers actually even mean anything? And it doesn't, like if the numbers are both meaningless, it doesn't matter if we beat them. And then it kind of goes into the whole conversation of contamination and stuff that we won't go down the rabbit hole of right now. <laughs> sure, we'll say that for our third uh, our, our third time together, don't worry. But it's just but like even basic that... math. <laughs> Well, it's funny because when you, when you you started that by by talking about when when you see someone breaking a core tenet of machine learning, 
you know, be skeptical. But a lot of people don't know those core tenets of machine learning. And, and in fact, you kind of just said one, which is whenever you're training any machine learning model, you know, screw language models for a second, even like training a decision tree classifier on some classification data set, the bare minimum, the floor of any machine learning engineer's job is to beat the null model, which is if it's a classification, for example, what would you get by guessing optimally the same thing over and over again. Like if the class is in balance and like 60% of them are, are in one class and you just guess that class over and over again, you got 60%. So you gotta at bare minimum beat 60%. And in this case, when you're talking about MMLU, you know, solving a multiple choice question, it's kind of the same principle, which is, well, if you just kind of guess, <laughs> you're gonna get 25%. So if we're not even beating consistently 25%, what is the point of looking at this model with like serious eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I'm building a, it, it's a fun, it's a, it's even fun to look at this. Like I just added this to a research project that I'm building where the it's 50%. So I was like, okay, I added the line of shame, which is you do worse than a coin flip <laughs> on, on my little internal leaderboard, which is like, yeah, it, it happens. It's not easy to get signal always. No, it's not. And, and to be fair, again, to be extremely fair, these are extremely high level numbers. You know, accuracy is, uh, you know, is one metric coming back to the example of classification. You got precision, recall, F1. Like, there's so many more ways to probe in and say, hey, look, maybe the overall accuracy is here, but our precision is 90 and our, our recall happens to be 20 or whatever it is. And, and then they can make the case then to say, is our model amazing at all things? No. But here are some applications in which these kinds of situations would actually be beneficial. High precision means it would be not the worst situation to use for, you know, diagnostics capabilities, because when it says yes, you can at least trust it. Uh, and, and that kind of nuance tends to be lost a little bit, right? In this, in this really hierarchy of where are we ranking all of these models, you kind of lose the nuance of, well, for what? Using the model to help teenagers write essays or using the model to help lawyers review uh, law documents? Like, what are we talking about when we say better and worse? So I think a lot of that nuance is not out the window per se, but it's just secondary or tertiary or, or further down on the list of conversation topics. Yeah. I mean, to be, to, to wrap it up to like be specific, like some of the popular benchmarks like MMLU and Big Bench Hard or grade school math they have different ways of computing the, the score and it, you need to make sure that you're compared. Like the, these should be documented, but there's like literally different ways of computing the number. And then the number is what people copy. So like we, I had to do the, I had to do the work of like tracking down how these different models computed their numbers and be like, at least, I, at least I can say how they did it, but it's not even fun when you're doing that. Again, core tenet of math, don't forget your units or else what are you talking about? How do you compare these two things? <laughs> uh, sorry, Akshay, go, what were you saying? No, no, I was saying I just uniformly, and this is like, I don't know, like there's certain news weeks where this is like 50% of your news feed. Like it's, it's just literally this model was released, some claim to parameter count. It's all performative nonsense. And I almost always filter this out. Um, and is clearly driven by this PR news cycle where there is some product lead or engineering lead who wants to announce uh, and, and is put on a PR cycle. Like the way this mechanically works is you have some product launch and then marketing takes that over, works with the PR firm. They publish a bunch of news around it and then try and um, sort of get stuff out there. But the other thing is now I feel like Nathan with like even these leaderboards, they've just gotten so gamified that we, we talked about, we mean, we had um, other folks talking about, you know, more, need for more modular, you know, benchmarking, uh, et cetera. It's, uh, it's like that midwit meme where like everyone looks at like, so the right end looks at the leaderboard, la left end looks at the leaderboard and the middle is, um, or sorry, yeah, the middle is like a great meme. Board, and then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's actually just like playing with the data and looking at the model that's relevant for your tasks. But it is a little bit one of those things where um, I remember initially getting a little more swayed when, uh, especially more so around when Llama 2 came out, when this was a little bit less of a thing. Now it's just become something I just completely ignore. There's something that's released recently. I wait for, uh, for wait, wait for the dust to settle. Yeah, it's normally safer to wait. I mean, there was a new model this week called like Smog 72B or something, which is supposed to be this like, it's like the top, it's literally like the top of the hugging face leaderboard. It's like an open model. And I was like, 
I'm just gonna wait. Like, I, don't, I think I literally saw people. that on my like my phone when it pulls up like the Google <laughs> results. It was like, yeah, recommended articles. I was like, no, Wordle for now, please. <laughs> it's pretty much like if that's your leading claim of your model, it's unlikely to be that that actually useful. Yeah, it, it's fine. It's perfectly fine to have good scores, but like most of the of time these days, when they lead with that, you're like, uh. uh I've got better things to do. <laughs> so it's like street smarts versus book smarts. Okay. Book smarts is good and all, but when you get out there and you got to start talking to people day to day, millions, billions of people out there, you got to have some street smarts. I've got a hot take that I even think chatbot arena is a little overfit too. Like chatbot arena is very good, but we don't know the distribution of the prompts. I have a guess that it's like a third code, a third like role play. And then like a third other stuff and like models that refuse weirdly are just going to get hammered, which is probably why like quad does really badly. And it's just like, I guess opening eyes, opening eyes, obviously really good, but like there's a lot of muddled stuff in between there, which we don't really know how much the models, like I have some data from them and I want to look into it, but we don't have the, we don't have the way to classify the prompts yet, but within a year or two, it'll be pretty easy to be like, these are the types of things people are asking in these conversational data sets. I'm pretty sure there's some chatbot arena com. There's a data set on uh, hugging face with a chatbot arena. And I, I remember using it for something and, and thinking a very similar thing, which is, you know, a lot of the times when you get one of those, you know, I can't answer that. It generally just gets voted down because, well, hey, I wanted you to answer it, but yeah. that's not really up to you all the time. <laughs> uh, actually, I totally agree when you were talking about a lot of like, this PR, this marketing hype and especially when you're talking about Llama, especially companies like Meta, you know, um, Microsoft, like when they put out Google with Gemini, what, when you put out models, it is an opportunity to, you know, make a name for yourself and say, hey, here's where we are on the map. Here's where we stand. Here's what we're doing. And sometimes that can really get muddled in with, well, how actually useful is, is the model or is this all just marketing? That being said, other institutions who have more intent behind those releases and, and, and deployments, they can have a lot of different intents. And obviously, I'm, I'm kind of coming back to Nathan here, because uh, you recently, your institution, Nathan was part of an amazing team that recently open sourced one of the, one of the first, if not the first, fully uh, open sourced LLMs, uh, Olmo. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, so we could talk about why evaluation is hard, too. I think... Um... There's a long story of essentially, I see nothing that gets people, scientists more nerd sniped than evaluation, which is like these things that we're talking about. So it's not just people that are trying to follow this. It's like people who are building these models. It's definitely not the first open model, but it's probably like the third or the fourth that follows in a few really important artifacts. So like Bloom, everyone knows about this like huge multi-organization, open multilingual model that Hugging Base kickstarted. They're not the only ones involved. And then Pythia from Eleuther AI which is like pretty solid models at the time, but not how models are used now. So the biggest change in how people train models now is we train them for a lot more tokens. So it's kind of hard to compare models from Pythia to what Olmo is. And then Olmo is like the start of a process. I think compared to those, those two other things kind of were one set and done. And Olmo is kind of being like, okay, we're going to really try to keep training and improving models in the open and keep releasing them and trying to have them be state of the art. And the models, are okay. Like they're not at Mr. level. They're a little below Llama 2. So it was actually like a, we did a tokenization error in our Llama 2 evals. So the scores we reported for Llama were slightly low and this should be updated on the blog post now, but like, obviously we're not going to be able to make noise about like, we messed up our table a little bit, <laughs> but like essentially the issue for I don't cut like, that out. <laughs> to, to like, for people that want to know what the weird things are is essentially it's like, if you're asking a multiple choice question, the llama tokenizer was having an extra space before the answer. So it expects question colon space answer. And our code had question colon space space. And that root messes the error that evals up a couple percent. And then that's enough to make it so Olmo was listed at the top, but technically llama two is the best. And it's like, okay, like now our blog post is, <laughs> but like, that's the type of thing that's determining these numbers of people comparing models. And like, yeah, it's just really hard. It's like not it worth is. spending all of your days on. It is extremely hard. And I think, uh, I mean, your approach, even like very frankly, Nathan, like e even even the come on and say, oh yeah, we performed slightly worse than uh, Mr. Lil Mama on those case. And then you explain like, well, then here's how it happened. And then here's how you do it. And that's not always the point. And I think that's really my point, which is it's not always the point to only release models 
when they're better than everyone else, right? Because if you've never checked out um, anyone listening, if you, if you haven't checked out Olmo, I recommend you do because it's not just downloading a model and trying it out and see what happens. There's the eval uh, framework. There's the um, there's the DPO framework. There's all of the frameworks, all of the code, all of the data, which by the way, as a Turk, I do appreciate that it's called Dolma, the data set. <laughs> um, everything's there. And, and, and again, to Nathan's point, they're really trying to make a point of this is how open source is really supposed to look like. You know, this, this is what the process is meant to be. And I think a lot of people respond really positively to that. You know, when I talk about it in my lectures, you know, and I show the GitHub, everyone always says, wow, that's so much. And that's really just a short way of saying, oh, we're not used to this. That's not really how we've been trained to think about open source. So uh, what, what's what's coming next then for, for Olmo and, and for what you're all working on? Uh, more models, more modalities, Locked. trying to be better. It's like pretty simple. We're trying to get more compute. We're trying to do more of the same. <laughs> it's like, it's really like, that's the thing that I think is when you see major projects, you don't really know what's coming from them, especially with academics. It's like Pythia is great. It's like, okay, I know Luthier AI is doing other great things now, but it's like, they're not doing like Pythia too. It's like, yeah, we're going to do Olmo 2. We're going to do Olmo 70B, whatever. And we've already like publicly said all these things. Yeah. Um, we, we've talked about the model space and, and evaluation that for a while. There's two uh, concrete examples of discourse on how folks should evaluate papers that I thought we could walk through, Nathan, that both areas you're familiar with, uh, both kind of LoRa versus QLoRa, and then the deep PPO versus the DPO debate. In both instances, I think they're, you know, just discussions on different mechanisms for machine learning where I could read, luckily I have you know, you two, I can, I can text and different folks that I can ask to explain this to me. But for folks that get caught up in those sorts of stuff, maybe we could use both of those as examples of, Nathan, some, uh, maybe some problematic stuff in the discourse. And then how, uh, if you were to go back and, and how that those, those new cycles unfolded, how you would have, uh, you know, stayed grounded. I think both are relevant. One, you know, very relevant for RLHF and then QLORA, obviously, because of AI2's uh, you know, connection to, to, to that work there as well. So either or, but just curious how you would have navigated those news cycles a little differently and maintained grounded during those. I think they kind of are played out the same, which is like, there's been two methods, one of which has kind of been established from big players, which is like instruction tuning, normal instruction tuning and PPO. And then a new thing, which is simpler to implement or more efficient that a lot of people are using. And because it generally is a trend of when a lot of people use it, people assume that it's better. And just because it's easy to use that it is better, which is kind of, is kind, this kind of can go both ways. So it is like, when talking, this is kind of a link. It's like, when you see a paper, if there's actually code, it's normally better. And if you skim the code for five minutes, you can normally tell if they took this stuff seriously or not. And it's fine to take an academic project seriously as an academic project. But if you're trying to make it a serious tool that people train models with, it looks really different. Like QLora is an academic project. And if you open that repository, you're like, oh shit, there's CUDA kernels in this. This is this is a lot, which is very different than like a random RLHF method that's like, okay, they for hard forked something, deleted the Git history and added three lines of code which you also see, but like, it's a pretty clear flag that one of those is meant to have different types of longevity. And back to like QLora and DPO, like I expect there's still going to be more people doing QLora, especially on like the long tail of ML. A lot of people can fine tune models without it, but people do both. And there's like a trickle of results buried in papers as like QLora is not quite as good if you can do the other thing but that's kind of fine. And then DPO is the same thing, which is like most rumors and people are like, DPO is actually not quite as good and has these problems, but it'll move faster and iterate faster due to it being available. And it's just like, there's no apps. When there's an absolute, it becomes very obvious is the thing. And there's normally not obvious results these days. Yeah, I, I, I love that take on the absolute, right? There's always a new, I, I was about to say, cause I'm actually teaching a reinforcement learning class pretty coming up and I will be using more, I will, most of my examples when it comes to DPO versus PPO will be in proximal, will be PPO. And the reason when, whenever someone asks me this, cause I've, I've had people come up and ask me like in person, like, why are you using PPO when DPO exists? And I was like, a few reasons. One, it's pretty new. I'm still kind of figuring out like where, where it stands. It's more, it's newer at least. Second, and I, this is the point that, that usually sticks, which is, 
what if you don't have direct preferences? And I, my, one of my examples is using like a sentiment classifier to make summaries of from Flan T5 more neutral sounding. So like if you don't use more positive or negative words, be as neutral as possible. And I use like a sentiment uh, classifier from Hugging Face basically as the reward mechanism, just to see the difference, to show people this is what you can do when you don't have direct preferences, but you have a model that you can trust to give rewards. And, and that tends to stick more. And again, it all comes back to your point, Nathan, which is people really, it's easier to think about things in not even absolutes, just ordinarily. Like A is better than B, therefore forget A ever existed, B is everything until C exists. And then continue that train until, you know, something, something happens. But it's not that easy, right? I, I think, you know, that, that seems fair. Yeah, I, it's like, I think that what it manifests now is that there's a lot of papers that use DPO and things like that. And it, it, this is definitely one of the harder ones in information diet is just like figuring out how to be okay with the fact that the distribution you're sampling from is very biased. And like, there's more papers because it's more available, but like the quantity is a bad, like quantity is simultaneously a good and a bad metric. When there's quantity of people doing exactly the same thing, that means the idea is validated. But just because there's like more people in a space doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. It's just like gasty, which a lot, happens a lot right now. Like there's so much to be gained by being timely. Like there's a lot of financial and personal gain by being in the right area, which is a safe thing to do. But that doesn't mean that you have to assume that it is just definitively better. It's just safe for people to work in. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this basic stuff is to be more conscientiousness, going back to the kind of model point. Um, but this, it's funny, I feel like you would not trust a study if it said cell phones caught cancer and had a sample size of 12. The equivalent of that is literally just scanning <laughs> the quality of like the reproducible code. That it, like You can see the amount of time someone um, went and kind of published it. The other thing is, I think there's um, something I do frequently that helps specifically on some of this stuff, because the model stuff I've just sort of immediately filtered out. Uh, and I'm less technical than, than than you are both, and I'm not uh, not as familiar with a lot of stuff. So I actually have to rely on other people. I genuinely actually like Google the author names and see what like they've submitted into prior yeah. conferences, et cetera. I, I do, do that too. too. It's, it's so I feel bad. bad. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's not bad. There's just so much noise, and I actually want to know. But it's crazy. You have these sub stacks. I met a random sub stack owner who's doing probably north of 10K a month and just doing summaries of ML papers. But 60% of the papers don't have reproducible code. And another 30% are written by paper that have not, you know, published at, at an iClear, at an ICML, et cetera. Yeah. And so just to add to that, I can't, uh, just doing that like added double click has really. It, it's yeah. a good practice. I think it's good it to be like, it's, you should be aware that sometimes new things happen from other places, but it's good, it's good to follow where work is coming from, from different things. And like, I think, different types of people will follow different tracks of work easier. Like I can obviously follow a North American paper easier than an Asian paper, but some of these Asian papers are releasing really good artifacts and then we end up using them anyways, but it's just like, there's some time delay there. And back to like reading the code, we're luckily coming to a place, at least if you're working in like RLHF or alignment where a good litmus test is like, if they have a demo of the model and if they're willing to put their model out there and like people can talk to it, it's really like, okay, these people are, much more serious about what they're doing because either they're going to be right or they're going to get roasted but like them getting roasted for having a bad model is like still they're probably going to improve a lot faster which that change is huge than just kind of having random get like large files on google drive that you like no one's ever going to use it's like okay like, yeah i mean that whole idea of like offline versus online feedback is, is all is all for me it's a lot of product um engineering because the idea is you know when you build a product you test it internally you get a lot of offline feedback from people you know, at the company or, or, or whatever. It's only when you put it out there and you start actually collecting feedback from real people who are going to use it under real circumstances, that online feedback, that you can really start to understand, okay, this is how people wanted to use the model. And hopefully you're logging all of that as well. It all ends up back in your, in your data set if you're training a model or what have you. But that, that notion of, of putting it in front of people and saying, what about this is... Is, it can be quite useful. Now, of course, it, you have to measure that with you making the claim, like, this is the best thing you're ever about to see. It, Here is it is. Is this something that, like, <laughs> tech historically had a problem with? 
because ML is just coming around to it, which is realizing that you need like, like there's a dev advocate role, which is like, I do a lot of this work, but not because it's like what I'm compelled to do is just kind of like under index right now is a lot of people don't want to do the work of like taking your work to somebody else. Like, I don't know if that's always been a problem in tech, but that's really a thing right now where a lot of labs and good groups are not doing that work, which is like de delivering it. <laughs> like they're going to, they're like make, they're like putting products into the world, but everyone's information diet is so effed up that sometimes you need to go and like literally put it in front of them and be like, this is my cool new thing. You must now try this. <laughs> and that's like distribution channels and how that controls people's AI diet diets. And you should definitely like having people that you trust is good. Like it doesn't need to be me. And like, AK was the first person getting big tweeting papers on this, but I think that like really people should try to find smaller people than AK that they trust for a specific domain that they're interested in because you can't follow everything in ML. It's like, you should follow a few people, somebody that's good at pre-training and like, just, they don't have to be around forever, but like that type of diet does give you a, an edge. Yeah. I think one thing that since we're on the topic of improving information diet, I think it is a, it's a big issue in the, in the tech ecosystem, like even developer tooling, you talk about developer evangelist, Nathan, like it's a very classic, like developer, you know, it looks great in this like quick demo I'm doing on stage. And like the minute you have questions, like I'm nowhere to be seen or et cetera, you get sent to some form. Mm -hmm. I had this really, really funny moment. It's head of an ML of a, of a company that uh, uh, we'll all know, but uh, he said something really funny. So we're at a conference and he's presenting on basically these different ML topics and specifically uh, more like data engineering topics, so like language model, infrastructure, et cetera. He's midway through his presentation. He's like, and I want to call out that none of the like, screenshots I've presented today are actually from anyone technical. They're all from venture firms blog posts. And so <laughs> and everyone just started cracking up where there is this weird thing in the ecosystem in tech where it's like, it tends to be that, um, you know, we have, you know, key, you know, different incentives, either portfolio companies, et cetera. You know, we filter a lot of the feedback. We don't understand a lot of it. And then we disseminate it, which creates a bunch of uh, positive, you know, effects in the sense like people are more aware of certain topics. Now people, I think, are more interested in machine learning. We're having, you know, a lot of great discussions about this stuff, but at the same time has negative externalities as well, which is if you also don't have a, in the same way LMs are grounded, et cetera, if you don't have something in key experts that you're grounding to, you're going to get just lost in the wind. And so I think there's a lot of that happening where there's almost this funnel of information hierarchy where if you don't get it straight from, you know, I think established technical sources and you're just listening, this, hap this happened in tech for a long time where uh, it's really hard to, I think, parse through and you get really, really mixed information. So um, I, I'm generally staying off Twitter. I'm like along with you, Nathan, obviously, and, and texting you, Sanan, I'm trying to find four or five people I really, really trust and actually just go deep on, on their work uh, versus, and then if someone else brings up a topic to me in conversation and they're like, oh, you shouldn't know about it. That's generally when I get interested in it versus um, I think just buying into to every new topic. That comes uh, yeah. Up. There's a lot of benefit to not being trying in the rat race right now. You need to really think about it. If your incentives are to really follow all the noise that's happening. Most people don't. Speaking of the like hilariousness of this and why it's so okay for people to be overwhelmed, I was like, I wasn't logged into a browser the other day and I opened GitHub and even GitHub is like the world's leading AI powered developer platform. I was like, what is their weird ass like what? hugging face what like, slogan <laughs> on their like website? <laughs> and it's like, why does everything have to be this right now? So that's what you see if you open GitHub in an incognito window. It's just like, how do we end up here? Like, why did GitHub need to rebrand? Because <laughs> these analyst reports, you know, like, have you seen these, like, uh, there's like a bunch of quant bots that'll like front run a stock if it mentions AI more. So now like all these CFOs oh, and like CEOs are just trying to drop AI as much as possible. Oh my like, God. The stock because they're like, oh, maybe we're affiliated and correlated with NVIDIA and some, you know, algorithm and it boosts the stock. So that's literally happening now, which is like- And look, I hate- Instead of to drop- I hate making the comparison. But when you follow a really <laughs> hyped up technology from sub hype to sub hype to sub hype, maybe like crypto, it might lead to some bad places, right? Not saying it's all going to collapse, but the more analogies you kind of find to those to, to crypto, the more I, I try to take some pause because 
when crypto became huge, and I'll, I won't say crypto, I'll say, you know, blockchain technologies, fungible, non-fungible tokens, the whole ecosystem. When that ecosystem starts to get big, you, you all of a sudden see a lot of new people who are suddenly experts in the topic who are disseminating information very similar to kind of what you see today. And then you move from sub-hype to sub-hype, meaning, you know, ERC-20 for fungible coins, um, 721 for NFTs. And then there were derivatives of NFTs that would make things nuances more easy and then you get to this point where everything's so inflated and then obviously you know there's a bit of a collapse and bad things happen but i'm not saying we're on that path but you can you can draw a lot of these correlates so there are pathways in which you know enough people are are kind of acting this way where um you know we have to be uh careful so nathan maybe you can help us out um, by giving us and our, our listeners some constructive advice on, you know, where, what are some of the top things, we kind of started talking about this already with code and stuff, but what are some of the top things that you kind of browse and look for uh, just to give you some initial signal of this is actually good to dive into a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you should be like me because I've like to actively read Twitter to try to find, but like make sure I'm up to date because I write and produce content on this. So there's like a pretty different thing. And, and most of my information is partitioned either into papers or like model releases. And I mostly only really follow model releases that have weights available, which is mostly on hugging face and like data sets available. Just because all the other things, if it's a big tech company, it's like, A, it's covered by way more people. So you don't, you, you normally could wait and you're going to get the answer about inflection, Google, whatever open ai's new models like yeah you should use them but you like you making your own judgments based on using the models is more important than whatever eval scores they tend to give you it's like open ai was telling us about like ap exams when they released gpt4 it's like they could have just been like this shit's real good should be like this is yeah it's like that's weird so then then it's like papers and things like this which is a lot of okay it's coming to me as i talk but like a lot of the papers you we talked about basic things like the, the the basic things we discussed like code availability and basic quality um model access and if there's an endpoint as kind of being the highest weights and then you kind of look at to be what the core experiments are and based on the scale of the experiments and what like what size of models they're training for most nlp papers is pretty clear indicator there should be a mental cutoff at like a billion parameter models. And if they don't crack that, it's like, it doesn't mean that the paper is not technically sound and not interesting, but if you're really trying to be on what the cutting edge and it's going to drive models that people are using, like filtering to papers that have larger models is normally fine to start with because there's plenty of them right now. And then you should also kind of make this sort of technical leap of whether or not it's a technical report or a paper where papers are designed to be opinionated and kind of stake ground where technical reports are trying to be like, we just did this thing. So like the Zephyr model from Hugging Face is just like a technical report. It's just like a list of things that we did, which is normally much less opinionated, but it also will have fewer comparisons externally. So you kind of need to like mix and match between what are the models doing or like what are the kind of vibes where where a, a paper, especially one for a conference like NERFs or whatever, like you need to tell a story to get it in. So you have to like, you can buy into the story if it's fun, but like you're kind of trying to dissociate from all of that and just be like, what is the actual underpinning truth here? And that's not easy to do. At the end of the day, it's all vibes. It really it's, is. Yeah. It's all vibes. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. It's all vibes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Nathan, no, I really appreciate it because you... I, I look at like figure quality and stuff. Like, if they had the You're, time to make like an actual pretty figure or have error bars, it's just like, is this okay. clearly matplotlib with no like, further design? <laughs> <laughs> and like these things are normally pretty strongly correlated, unless the person has established a brand of like just not doing anything yeah. and just like, but like you'll normally figure that out pretty fast. Yeah. Well, uh, Nathan, I think as we wrap up, I'll, 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 I'll do some plugs a little bit for, for you as well. If uh, any of our listeners out there, if you're looking for even more content, you want more of Nathan's content, you should check out his uh, newsletter, Interconnects. And he has his own podcast for Toward AI. I was just listening to it this morning on the Waifu episode. I'll leave it at that. And everyone else can take a listen for themselves. 
Nathan, thank you so much for, for being on the show as always. Like it, it is so nice to have you. It's so great to like bounce these ideas off of you and talk with you. Um, and, and just, you know, be with you in this space because it is hard. It is challenging. Everyone has different incentives and none of that is bad. It's just how do we figure out how to do all this together without hurting, without hurting the field and without hurting anyone. So thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah. Thanks for having me.